let's go. Stock up, stock down. Which LSU players have helped their chances for more potential playing time moving forward? And which players have also done the opposite? So I want to start off, obviously, with the big news that Cavantre Bradford is coming back to LSU's football team. Now, how big of a news story is this? Well, the first thing we need to figure out is, can he play right now? And the answer to that is obviously still up in the air, but obviously his effectiveness is also up in the air as well. Jake Peets is a new offensive coordinator, as is DJ Mangus, a new passing game coordinator, and Cavantre Bradford, of course, has only been with LSU for only a year. He transferred to Oklahoma, and now he's back. This is a very thin running back room right now with Ty Davis Price, who could go down in any moment. Uh, obviously, Josh Williams was a running back who had a good performance overall as a pass protector and receiver out of the backfield, but still not really anyone special with the football in his hands. And obviously, we still yet to see Corey Kiner. So obviously, this does seem like it's some really good news for LSU. I, I just don't really see this being that much of a needle mover. You know, you look at Cavantre Bradford last year, number one, he did struggle to catch the football out of the backfield. And number two, as a runner, it was kind of up and down. His Ole Miss game overall was really good. That was a game where he actually played the most at the end of last year. He only missed one blatant cut in that game, but overall he was solid. But the run blocking in that game was also not great. So the bottom line is if the run blocking doesn't get better, it doesn't matter who actually is toting the football back there. With that said, with the way that TDP looked in this game, uh, you could make a case that Cavantre Bradford is an upgrade. Stock down is John Emery. Look, it's time to move on from the John Emery story. I, I understand he is a five-star. I understand he wasn't just a five-star. He was the number 13th ranked player in the country. And I also understand that John Emery can be really talented. But when you're in year three and there's these quote-unquote academic issues that are popping up right before the season, I'm like, wait, how does an academic issue pop up the week of the LSU game? Or was this something that was always up in the air leading into the week of the LSU game? Because apparently, according to 247 Sports, it wasn't just John Emery. It was John Trey Kirkland and Sony Fanua with also some academic issues. So, you know, LSU really is just failing in so many different aspects right now. Obviously, more importantly, John Emery just, you can't rely on him. And your best ability is availability. And last year, when we really needed him, he was hurt. Uh, he has yet to really do anything big or clutch in crunch time up to this point in his career anyway. So if you're relying on John Emery to come back, number one, we don't know if he's going to be able to academically qualify to even play this season. And we've yet to really see him do something in an actual pressure pack game that would tell us that we could rely on him to go out there and win us some football games. And once again, it doesn't matter if the run blocking just quite simply doesn't get better. Stock up, I, I got to go with Brad Davis. And I understand that it, it doesn't seem like that would be the right idea, right? Well, Brad Davis, the, the, the run blocking wasn't better for LSU. And guess what? It, it really wasn't. LSU couldn't get anything on the ground. I agree with that. However, the blitz pickup for LSU was actually really good. Now, there is a difference when it comes to blitz pickup and pass protection. The execution wasn't the absolute best, but after one really bad, blatant, missed blitz pickup from a player we'll get to in just a second, um, outside of that, the blitz pickup was actually good. The thought process of picking up the exotic UCLA blitzes actually got better. Now, sometimes they got home, and sometimes it wasn't executed well, but last year, a big problem for LSU was just allowing unblocked blitzers to run through interior gaps. Outside of one blatant miss in the first quarter, once again, LSU actually did a decent job of that for the rest of the game compared to last year where they were just abysmal at it basically for the entire season. So what does that tell you? 
that Brad Davis has made this offensive line at the very least smarter. And that's obviously a huge step forward. Now, as far as fixing the run blocking is concerned, I think a lot of that has to do to Jake it has to do with Jake Peets getting more creative with this run blocking play calling. And also run blocking sometimes just comes down to ability. Can the guys actually move bodies up front? If you know, there's only so much coaching you can actually do for that. However, blitz pickup is a very mental thing, and it was slightly better against UCLA, especially compared to how bad it was in games versus Mississippi State last year, Texas A&M, Missouri, the list goes on and on. Knock down, I'm going to go with the returning starters on the offensive line, along with the returning starter at tight end, Cole Taylor. Uh, I'll start with that, Ingram. I, I thought we saw some serious regression in the UCLA game, and he had some very interesting quotes to the media about um, players being out of shape and not knowing the assignments, and uh, Liam Shanahan continued. He also spoke with the media saying they weren't 100% prepared for everything that UCLA threw at him. I spoke to a few UCLA film guys, including our guy Chris Osgood. He said that there wasn't really anything out of the ordinary, but obviously it was crazy that UCLA blitzed so freaking much. Now, I, I'll say this. I, I thought Ed Ingram was LSU's most inconsistent offensive, line against, uh, offensive lineman against UCLA. He did tweet out that I'll be better, so there's some personal responsibility there. But, you know, this unit, some of the quotes that were said today were very troubling. Overall, like I said, the blitz pickup was better. Uh, Austin Deculus' health, he gets hurt a lot during games. A lot of tread is worn off those tires. I have some 7th grade Nike Shocks basketball shoes that have more friction on them than than. Uh, Austin Deculus at this point. Uh, stock up, it's going to sound crazy, but it's Garrett Nussmeyer. He's going to get his opportunity to show up and show out against McNeese State. And uh, your stock as a backup quarterback always goes up when the starter doesn't play well. And Max Johnson is a stock down for me. I like Max. I like his dad, Big Bad Brad on TikTok. I love Max's moxie. I love what he did in the final two games of the season. The Florida game was an all-time great performance in LSU history with everything you, you put that was on Max's plate for that game. But the regression has been very real. Uh, a few things here. The first is we did a full Max Johnson film study just on red zone throws. The game starts to speed up in the red zone because the field compresses and Max has not been a good red zone quarterback. Um, his pocket awareness in the game against UCLA overall was also not that great. Now, there were some droppable, or excuse me, some catchable passes uh, that could have been caught 50-50 balls. Some of that is due to the fact that Max doesn't have the elite arm strength. He doesn't sometimes just plant his feet in the ground and, and just fire it. Sometimes he's throwing off his back leg, which can ruin the timing with the wide receiver. Uh, I think it's all those things. And keep this in mind. You know, there there has never been an LSU quarterback that has had a successful career having to start year two in their development. If you want to see our study on that, it's floating in the top right corner of your screen. It's never happened. And Max Johnson is a full-time starter year two in his development. And you saw a lot of the mistakes that he made in this game. Uh, he missed some really big throws. Obviously, the Trey Palmer throw over the middle, that would have been a touchdown. There was nobody on him. He would have run 65 yards in on his own. You got to make that throw. I understand everything was hot, and they were blitzing you at a million miles per hour. Well, when they do that, you got to make them pay. And once you stock up here, it's pretty easy. Brian Thomas Jr., Jack Bash, they need to play more, not less. Uh, they, they had two of the more impressive receptions on the night, and both of them combined for only one target moving forward. I thought Brian Thomas Jr. was filthy in the second half uh, with one of his routes. We did a film study on that yesterday. These two have got to play more. They're real talents. And uh, Jack Besh didn't surprise me at all. I thought he'd be ready to go. Once again, it's still very early, but Brian Thomas Jr. is by far the best true freshman wide receiver. Once again, we still got to see Malik Neighbors. 
Uh, but BTJ looks like that next great guy. He is Terrace Marshall duplicated, uh, and he could be better. Uh, he's got to play more. And stock down, I, I, I got to go with Mickey Joseph and DJ Mangus here. The wide receiver rotation is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Part of the reason why Max Johnson has struggled is the wide receiver rotation, right? Developing the chemistry. And this is what really irks me about Ed Orgeron. He says something, but does the exact opposite of what makes those things great. Perfect example. He has said repeatedly that he wants to bring back the 2019 offense. Well, a major tenet of why that offense was so great wasn't just because Justin, Jamar, and Terrace were all-time great SEC wide receivers. That is definitely the case. However, it was also the fact that no one else played, okay? Rarely did Derek Dillon or Stephon Sullivan play as the next wide receivers on the depth chart or Racy McMath. Uh, it was because those three and those tight wide receiver rotations and the chemistry that they built with Joe Burrow. There's just too many mouths that they're trying to feed, and it hurts your quarterback's chemistry. Now, who should those wide receivers be? Well, I think LSU's best wide receiver grouping would be Kayshawn, Jure, and Brian Thomas Jr. Now, I've said a thousand times I'm a big Jure Jenkins fan. Not only does the tape back it up, the advanced stats back it up. I understand he's not overly impressive. He's not overly fast, but... He looks the part. You look at EPA per play. You look at ADOT. You look at all those things. Uh, it was still good for Jury in this game versus UCLA. He dropped a really tough 50-50 ball. And okay, outside of that, he was three catches for 46 yards. Still high yards per catch. He gets down the field. He knows the spots in the, the, the weak spots of the zone. High football IQ. Also really good red zone awareness. And uh, th- they're deciding to play Trey Palmer more, who had 11 targets, but 47 yards on those 11 targets obviously isn't that great. Didn't break a whole lot of tackles when he got those targets. Now, a lot of that were underneath routes just to move the chains. I get it. He is a slot wide receiver. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm just not really a huge Trey Palmer guy. No difficult contested catches yet to his resume. Drops are also attached to his resume that are dating back to last year. I understand he's really fast in the 100 and 200 meter dash, but there are no deep perceptions to his name whatsoever, whereas Dere Jenkins has quite a few deep perceptions to his name. You can be faster than someone else. It doesn't mean that you're the better deep wide receiver. And I, I do think Coy is a better pure slot receiver than Trey Palmer. Um, either way, both of those guys uh, below 10 yards per catch overall in their careers, which you know is a red flag. We want receivers that can stretch the field, make guys miss, and I'm not sure either one of those guys are the answer in that aspect. I I, I do like Coy a little bit more than Trey in that aspect. I do believe the best wide receiver trio, though, is BTJ, Jure, and obviously Kayshawn. Nevertheless, the wide receiver unit as a whole would be better off if LSU just stuck with three guys and the occasional fourth wide receiver rotation. Because here's what's interesting. Those weren't the only guys that played, okay? Devonta Lee also got snaps and a target, which he dropped. Uh, Chris Hilton also got some snaps, if I am not mistaken. And uh, nothing. Uh, When you're rotating all these guys in, what's the point of it? What are you you trying to get out of it? Are are you trying to keep those guys happy? Uh, Because I, I don't understand giving guys snaps that have yet to prove anything uh, out of the ordinary. It should be, you should be undeniably great to get snaps at the strongest position LSU has, which is wide receiver. So tighten the rotation because this isn't working. And keep this in mind, Malik Neighbors and Jontre Kirkland also would have gotten snaps if they were healthy and or eligible to play. So it's wild. (laughs) <laughs> it's wild that the rotation is what it is. What I think LSU might do, and this was a suggestion that I made before the season, I think LSU will run more 10 personnel moving forward. If the run game continues to, to struggle and Cole Taylor continues to struggle, LSU would just be better served to run four wide receiver sets. If that's the case, 
uh, your wide receiver rotation will have to thicken. But even then, uh, it's just way too many guys getting reps right now. Way too many. And down below who you think stock up, stock down. And let me know if you like this type of video because obviously this was just the offense. I don't mind doing a defensive one as well. It is power hour LSU bomb. Ooh, we're doing chicken wings tonight. Let's go.